I'm Professor Tony Bellini, and today's talk is about 1871 and 2112. And uh, really, the focus here is we think it's really important to interface with industry uh, uh, concerning legal issues in the tech uh, tech sector and legal issues affecting business decisions. And so the legal issues could be intellectual property, data privacy, contracts, all sorts of things. And so the course that my students here are in right now, uh, basically they, they go to 1871, this technology incubator, and they learn from tech executives and lawyers about cutting edge issues. They also go to this other incubator, and they'll talk about it some more. It's called 2112. It's a music, TV, and film incubator. Same thing, they learn about legal issues in that context. And so with this course, they're, they're, you know, students are interfacing with industry. Um, we're also developing a robust uh, technology law program, which kind of ties in. And of course, we have an existing uh, really solid IP program. So my goal today, I'm already talking too much. I want you guys to hear from the students. So I wrote down some questions. What is, um, well, I guess we'll get to the questions in a second. Maybe we'll just go down the line. Everybody introduce yourself. And, say a little something about yourself and then, uh, then we'll start getting into the substance so sure Austin start yeah. us off. Austin Fabry I am uh, kind of a 3L I started out part-time and then moved into full-time uh, so I'll be done in December I kind of had a carryover semester because of that um, want to go into patent litigation when I'm done I uh, had a bio background and came to law school for that purpose and came to DePaul, chose DePaul because of their uh, IP program specifically. So that is the plan when I finish here. Can I get through here? Sure. Sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You guys, no, you're fine. <laughs> uh, my name is Marissa Pogomsky and I'm at real at DePaul. Um, I'm looking to go into, or actually I am in the investment funds group. My name is Salem Zidane. I am a 3L, and I am currently studying data privacy. I'd like to go into data privacy if I can. If not, I also have a certificate in business, so most likely you'll see me at a law firm. <laughs> My name is Kayla Jewell. I'm a 2L. Um, I wanted to go into intellectual property, more in the entertainment side, and work with um, film and music somehow. My name is Chelsea Murray. I'm a 2L. I chose DePaul mainly because of its intellectual property uh, program. My undergrad degree is in computer science, and I currently work at a firm um, doing mostly patent litigation. Uh, my name is Matt Kress. Um, I've worked as an executive before I came to law school. Uh, like Chelsea, I'm also interested in intellectual property. I liked what DePaul was doing in terms of its intellectual property program and merging IP with tech. So that was a big draw for me here. And as uh, Salam said a minute ago, I, I was also really drawn to DePaul because I think we have a very unique student body here. Um, law school is very competitive, but I think we're all very civil to each other. We really help each other. Um, we. I think are sort of in the same boat together and rowing in the same direction. And I really think that that's very unique at DePaul. Uh, I don't want to take away from, from the time of the panel, but I, I went to all the law schools in Chicago and I sat in on classes and I observed all the students talking with one another and I, I observed professors interacting with students. And I did this on several occasions, way outside of the open houses. I actually went to the, the real classes and just sat in the back. And I really felt that there was a, a, a special community among the student body at DePaul, both among students as well as among the, the professors and students. And so it was, it was just, it was just a, a very good, very good fit for me. So I, I echo what, what my colleagues have said. So I'll just add a little bit more about myself. I, I've been teaching here for 13 years. Uh, started out full time patent practice. Uh, right now, I'm halfway through my master's in cybersecurity, so I'm trying to stay relevant, and that really ties into building our tech law curriculum. And the 1871 incubator is all about technology, so it's, it's kind of fun to be involved with this. So that's a few things about me. Um, I guess uh, we'll just kind of jump in with uh, these questions. 
what is 1871, what is 2112? So who wants to grab one of those questions and kind of expand on that? How would you describe either incubator? Um, me? Okay, I will go. Um, so I have been to both 2112 and 1871, so I'll speak to both. Um, 2112 is a little bit out of the way. 1871 is in the uh, Birkin Merchandise Plaza, is that what it's called, the Merchandise Mart. Um, so it's a lot easier to get to, at least from this location. Um, they're both, um, echoing what you were saying, um, incubators. Um, the first event that I saw at 2112 was about immigration and the new visas that are rolling out, particularly in the changing immigration landscape. Um, especially under this current presidential administration. And the second um, uh, the presentation that I saw was on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which I'm sure you all have heard about. Um, and it was actually my first real um, you know, plunge into that whole area. And that was at 1871. Um, both, yeah, they're harbor, they're, or they incubate a lot of startup companies and then they have these presentations where they invite a lot of people who are more entrepreneurial as well as um, attorneys and other professionals in the area. Great. Uh, and I guess we'll take another uh, volunteer who wants to tell us about an interesting event that either incubator and some of the legal issues you learned about. So who wants to jump in? I think we've all attended interesting events and I'll start with one of the I was talking to fellow classmates. I went and one saw about women's role play in society and law and in business and the way it works in our education and transforms into our society. So that's one of the uh, two events I attended really centered around that, especially on International Women's Day, March 8th, which I, in Cuba, because that, later that day I flew into Cuba, and it was so funny to see that on March 8th in the United States, I'm attending an event that nobody even knows, it's like International Women's Day. Go to Cuba and it's a giant event. It's like a national, everyone in the country knows about it. So I think there's several events that uh, each 1871 and 2112 both have that really graphs onto concepts of law, business, and society. If you guys wanna share what events you guys went to. Uh, well, last week Chelsea and I attended an event at 2112 on um, search engine optimization and how marketing is changing. Um, and we discussed a little after how that plays into some privacy laws. Because um, you don't always know what's happening on your phone and what like data it's recording. And I thought that was very interesting and relevant to what we're doing in law school. Yeah, just to add on to that. Um it was really interesting just to see from the marketing perspective and then looking at it from a legal perspective, um, I guess the privacy issues such as what type of data is legally allowed to be collected by companies. Um, I mean, we know that companies can see uh, or they market to us based on what websites we use, what products we use, but to what extent, I guess. Um, is the question so really interesting um, legal issues are posed from these events and it looks like uh, from reading your discussion post that you've even been exposed to European data privacy law and how it relates to US law. yeah definitely so just going off of uh, the privacy issues uh, that led me to do some research on European Union laws uh, the GDPR uh, which is really prevalent right now um, so yeah, that just basically how that's going to affect us in the United States, um, specifically towards search marketing and I guess how that pertains to um, marketing, online marketing, digital marketing in the United States um, and privacy issues. I, I, so right before I came to law school, um, so my, my, like Chelsea, my undergrad is engineering as well and I worked as an engineer for a couple of years worked in the tech space, but I also worked in the, in the advertising space, and one of the interesting things I ran into was data import-export laws. And so I find it fascinating that as, as Chelsea was, was, was saying, as products become more app-based and as we continue to move more towards this um, sort of data sharing paradigm where we can track usage and we can use that usage to market to others, well now if it's happening overseas with things like GDPR, if you've got an American company and they're processing that information, 
receiving it from overseas could could potentially trigger data import export laws as well, which is I think a fascinating area. So um, some of the talks that that, that I attended, uh, there was a talk, and, and these are all really interesting things. Um, three very memorable ones. The, the first was a systems engineer from Google. His name is is Joe, and he talked about the overall uh, new Google Cloud. A database system. Chelsea was there too and Sam was there too. And what's really neat about this course and what's really neat about uh, attending events at 1871 is when the, when the event concludes you just walk right up to the presenter and you say, hey Joe, you know, could you tell me a little bit more about this? And so Joe and I struck up a great conversation. We got talking a little bit technical about where data comes and where it goes and how it works and where the servers are located. And we got into some of the legal issues, which he's a more of a technologist, less of a less of a legal person. But he was very happy to say, "Come over to Google, and uh, I'll put you in touch with, with with the legal folks there if that's what you'd like." So, you know, very cool experience. And I did go over to Google, and I did do that. Um, Tom Sasnoff. I talked to Tom. Uh, he's the founder of Tasty Trade. Later, which I always want to call Tasty Freeze, but I made a note to call it Tasty Trade. Later, sold it to TD Ameritrade. Very interesting guy, built this platform from the ground up. It's interesting to get his perspective on what he expects from attorneys and how he wants attorneys to interact with him and with his business. So in terms of back to this course, you know, Professor Bellini was talking a little bit more about how do we get students more engaged and how do we get students connected with real life experiences. Well, this was a wonderful talk to hear an actual business person who started a company, who went through all the, the um, you know, trials of developing a successful business. What, what, a, what a person in, in his capacity looks for in an attorney and what he expects from his attorneys. And then the last that, that I recall very vividly, though they were all outstanding, uh, I met uh, Andrew Parkinson from Peapod. He was one of the founders of Peapod. And he talked about very early on in the 80s about his desire to uh, to secure technology rights, to uh, secure legal rights rather, to the technology that they were developing. Uh, fascinating, just very interesting interplay between legal and tech and, and business. I met a wonderful young man there. He's in his mid or maybe even early 20s. His name is Joseph Prosnitz. He founded a company called Upright. So he, he was there like me you know, to check this thing out founded a company called Upright. Uh, <laughs> he's got so much wonderful energy. Uh, he patented his product and he was trying to license out his patent. He's got a couple of prototypes. We became great friends and we still you know, talk um, every now and again about patent licensing issues and what is he seeing and what am I seeing and how could we work together. So it's such a, such a great forum to connect sort of the theory of legal that we learn in class with the realities of legal of what happens in real life across totally different types of industries, different types of clients. And um, as I say, it, it, it's the kind of class that I think requires that students apply their whole legal training, their whole legal brain, as I say, and it uh, allows us to really try out some of the things that we've learned in our 1L and, and 2L years. I'm just curious, have any of you, uh uh, like Matt had a chance to meet some people at these incubators or engage with people online, maybe? Yeah, just to quickly go off of what Matt was saying, um, at the very least, I think this class with uh, 1871 and 2112 has provided enormous opportunities in regards to networking. Um, like just last week, I know Kayla and I attended um, an event put on at 1871 uh, with an award or a best-selling author who is also an international human rights attorney and We were able to talk with her and also we connected on LinkedIn and now we're messaging on LinkedIn to set up a coffee meeting So it just you would never have those opportunities had we not gone to this event in 1871 or 2112 so. It makes networking a little less intimidating because you're not showing up to a strictly networking event where it's kind of awkward to approach people if you're not very outgoing, um, puts you in a little more casual setting to just approach people and talk to everyone in all kinds of different fields. 
2112 is actually really cool because when you walk in, there's like the 2112 side and then there's the recording studio side. And then if you walk down the hallways, there's hundreds of recording studios. And I've met several local Chicago musicians that way that are there to record songs. And also at the same time, because it's connected to 2112, they can find legal representation in different areas if necessary. So that was a cool aspect of 2112 that's unique to there as opposed to 18th Central. So I, okay. I, I keep hoping that one of you guys will meet a famous musician or movie star. I'm sure it'll happen. I'm hoping. Like Madonna? Is she still? Is they say Madonna? Chance the Rapper loves recording there, so. I haven't seen him yet, yeah. but we'll see. I think also I'm curious, do you guys know the setup of law school? Like your 1L year, 2L year, 3L year? Has anyone looked at a schedule? One of is like the basic building block for everything else, like yeah. contracts, torques, crane, from law that, and it builds second laws, some of that plus electives and third year. You really go into what you're specializing in, correct? How many of you have sat in in a law class? Do you guys just want to raise your hand? Not you guys. <laughs> Come on. Have any of you guys sat in a class yet to actually demo it? No. Have you? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like a. It wasn't. It was a trial class, and it was here actually, um, for not just admitted students, just any student interested. Absolutely. And um, it was like a mock class. It was, okay. a it was just so, to yeah. get a sense of you guys know the setup of law school. Like he was saying, your one L year is mainly uh, the building block of law. You'll take contracts, constitutional, and what you'll learn as you go down. It really branches out. So to even get this started was something like uh, we got the class, but then to log in in 1871, it's like going back to basics where like, do you guys remember how we were trying to get like memberships to 1871 by waiting two weeks? It, it, it changes the dynamics. Like one L year, it's really set up for you. You don't really do stuff like this. And then DePaul though in your two L and three L year allows you to kind of like get into topics like this where we start going back to, you know, the real interesting parts of law. So I was just wondering how many of you guys uh, are interested in stuff like this or if you guys have looked into it. Because I'll just not <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's yes. great. I think it's a great point though because you, you do have a set curriculum in your first year, but this course and a couple others, actually, I usually open this up uh, right in the summertime, so right after your 1L year, some of you can take this class and pick the presentations that you want to attend, and, and uh, actually I designed the class to be kind of fun. It's actually pass-fail. It is <laughs> so. I'm just reminding you guys that this is something that happens after your 1L year, yes. yeah. especially because you guys are all just admitted students right now, and you guys aren't in law school. This is open to also current students too, but when you guys start law school, you'll kind of get in the jam of like, I need to figure out how classes work, exams, um, I'm sure you guys are trying to understand like what's the best way to be at the top of your class, law review, etc. But what we're talking about too up here is networking, going to particular types of law that you might want to work in. Um, to specifically talk about the events that I went to, a lot of it was focused on women and how to succeed. Because for women in law, it's very different than men in law. And women in business, it's different than men in business. So the speakers I talked to and what they showed me was saying that how women, um, like something I was telling my colleagues, it, it takes them 90% sure of the answer before they raise their hand, while men will go with 60 to 50% sure. I, I go with 5% sure. <laughs> I raise my hand, but I'm 5% sure. So there is interesting types of law, and that's what this course, I think, really brings out. Um, and that's what I want to talk about, or what I'm, I would tell you guys, is that you have to wait until your 1L year ends to really get involved. You can join organizations, you can connect with the professors. And again, for DePaul University, it's a very open, it's a very uh, community-linked uh, kind of school. And, and, and I'd like to add, add to that. So, you know, um, Austin and some of my colleagues talked about 2112. When, when I took this class, 2112 wasn't part of the, the curriculum. I took it last, last summer. But what's really cool about DePaul is they're constantly innovating. They're, they're constantly trying new things. They're keeping up with the times, which is, which is I think, pretty rare. It's pretty unique. You know, law school tends to be very, very conservative. Law school tends to move very slowly. There, there tends to be a lot of sort of you know, uh, uh, academic inertia, right? <coughs> 
But I think what's really neat about DePaul is that we are trying new things. So 2112 is an add-on. It's an improvement beyond when I took it. And I'm kind of wanting to take this course again because I want to see what 2112 is about, quite frankly. And let me just rewind the clock one more year back. This class wasn't even around it, uh, a, a year ago. So you know, it's wonderful what Professor Bellini and, and a lot of the IP staff, uh, the IP staff is doing here in the fall. It's really very, very forward thinking stuff. And it, 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 in addition to the, the community aspect that Salam talked about a few minutes ago, uh, that, was, that, was the, that was the other major draw for me is DePaul is exceptionally forward thinking. They try new things. They're really integrating technology, intellectual property, and the law. It's just very progressive and forward, very forward thinking. And so with tech, getting students to 1871 was a big deal to sort of get involved with that tech community. And then with our tech curriculum right now, uh, I'm creating a course in US and EU data privacy, which I'm hoping some of you can take soon. Uh, we're creating a cybersecurity law course. And to be different, uh, we are trying to cross list a few computer IT courses from our, our College of Computing. So you could take a couple of courses. Once this is all approved, you'll be able to take a couple of courses from our computer school and have them apply for JD credit, which I haven't seen any other law schools do. And, and I think it's so brilliant because you know there's there's so much technical undercurrent in in today's just day to day jobs, right? And so I've heard a million times, and I continue to hear it that an attorney that doesn't know about intellectual property is 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 not is just at a disadvantage. There's 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 so much IP issues. There are so many IP matters that come through a general counsel's office nowadays. They have to be at least somewhat versed. And I think technology is similar too, right? It's very difficult to buy a company, sell a company, engage in some kind of commerce with a trading partner without some kind of touch of technology. And so these cross-listing efforts are a wonderful way for attorneys to at least pick up the language, the lingo, the basic concepts of tech so that when you're in a boardroom when you're negotiating with a trading partner, you're negotiating with, with general counsel on the other side, you've at least you've at least got a similar vocabulary. You've, you've at least got a, a good start. And actually piggybacking off of that, so I started in family law and um, you would think that intellectual property is not something that comes up very often, but I had a research project where I had to figure out whether our client who was a famous author and actually made a famous film, um, whether the future royalties from his books would be subject to marital like uh, dissolution. So basically, whether his wife would be able to get part of that money in the future. And so that's just to say that intellectual property really does touch every aspect of the law. And currently, um, I'm actually entering into a firm to do investment funds and private equity firms which um, drive a lot of innovation in our country right now, and which I previously had no idea about, um, they will be charged with the task of acquiring companies from across the board. So whether it could be, it could be a real estate company or it could be a company that's really driven in technology that has specific you know, data that they're implementing to make it easier for a specific industry, for example. So um, what I was going to say before we even got to that point was just that um, this class has been really helpful because for a number of reasons and for the first reason it's because your first year You're really just so immersed in law school that you honestly just don't even have a life to even think about What's going on in the world and then after that first year what you were saying is you kind of get like an idea of the expertise that you're kind of going into and so this gives you a really good chance to get into the market and see what's going on currently in Chicago and then globally as well um, and then start getting a feel for where the trends are going and if you don't know what you want to do it's kind of nice because then you can start picking out legal professions that you know are going to be um, you know likely impacted by so much business or activity in a certain market just quickly going off of that um, I took this class originally the summer after my 1L year and as we said, your 1L year is pretty laid out for you. You don't really have many options on what you can take. So 
doing this my at the summer after my 1L year, I was able to get some of that technology law experience. And I don't know how much you guys know about um, applying for summer associateships and all that, but you start applying and interviewing the end of your 1L summer for 2L summer associateships. So basically during my interviews for, for uh, this past summer, it was really a big talking point for me being able to talk about this class um, with potential employers because they really liked that I already had this, um, I guess, experience with technology law and intellectual property and entrepreneurship innovation. Uh, it's just really a good talking point, I guess, in interviews and beyond. <laughs> and I agree with that, especially, I don't know about everyone on the panel, but I have, like my background, I got an English degree and then I worked at a publishing house, so I don't have a big tech background. And these classes have, and the ones that Professor Bellini talked about implementing and these lectures have really helped get just a base knowledge so I can keep up with conversations and interviews. And it's, it's helpful. And, and, and I'll add to that too. I, I agree with Chelsea and my colleague Kayla as well. And it also helps you spot issues. You know, when you, when you pick up the Wall Street Journal, um, and you're reading through some of these articles, you can spot the, the, the IP issues, you can spot the constitutional issues, you can, you can spot this stuff, and it gives you even more things to talk about in, in your next interview. When your employer says, well, well, what are you passionate about? What are you interested in? You can say, oh, you know, I just read this morning about ba ba da ba da you know, there's a suit between Google and Oracle, and it's a $9 million uh, copyright infringement suit. Oh, my goodness, okay, tell me more about that. It seems like you're interested. Oh, well, here's what I read, and here's my theory, and so on. So it's it's neat stuff. It really is neat stuff. Maybe it gives you an opportunity to market yourselves online. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Chelsea yeah. wrote a, an article that she posted on LinkedIn based yes. on exceptionally well written. Yeah, <laughs> truly, really she well. She had a great legal writing. Yeah. Oh yes. Well, <laughs> really. <laughs> Actually, it was very. Um, I didn't really expect it to be a big thing, but then I started getting text messages from all these people uh, saying, oh, I saw your article online, like, congrats. I'm like, oh, I didn't really know that it reached this many people, but, yeah. You know, actually, uh, you know, one, one other thought that I'm having, too, I, I don't know how common this is, but I know at DePaul, um, I, I know at DePaul, um, we, we have a good mix of professors that have been in academia all of their lives, and then we have a really good mix of professors that have practiced first, so Professor Bellini practiced for many years before he joined DePaul full time. And then we also have a good mix of, of professors who are adjunct professors, so that means that they, they work, you know, their nine to fives or nine to nines or whatever they work, but then in the evenings or on Saturdays they also teach at DePaul. I don't know how common that is, maybe you have a better feel for that, but I, I, think, I think we have a nice mix where you can get a lot of the, 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 um, the, the theory, you can get a lot of the hands-on, and then you can also kind of hear the war stories, if you will, and you can you can hear what really goes on in a courtroom. You can really hear what happens with clients in certain situations. So I think that's pretty unique. Is that rare, or is that pretty ordinary? I think the mix is helpful. You know, at any law school, you want people who are academically respected and publishing good articles, and we certainly have those folks. Hey, Mike. Um, but also the, the practice skills are critical, too, because most law students are here to learn how to practice law such as our alumnus here, Mike Fleck, who is a practicing IP attorney who has uh, met some of my students over at 1871 and talked about some uh, IP issues. Uh, I think one of the talks, uh, Matt, Matt uh, last summer went to a talk uh, involving Peapod, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the principal of Peapod expressed some regret about not protecting IP rights, and I know, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about uh, startups and IP rights. So thank, first of all, so sorry I'm uh, a little late. Uh, I got so excited about the talk. I went to 1871 by accident. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm back. It's, uh, How was it? <laughs> it was dead quiet. There was no one there. It was me, the person at the guest, and nobody else. That's the opposite of what it's always like. <laughs> I, no, I'm kidding. It's probably going to be, I'm going in 20 minutes for an event. So. Nice. How are you going in 20 minutes? This ends at 5.30. Do you see how law students work their schedules? They're like, oh, well, I mean, I could cross over some things. Which is also what's great about 1871 and 2112 and this class. It really works with your schedule. 
one a year you're like trying to figure out how to live. Like when do I eat? When do I shower? I need to do both. Like so, there's it's. Anyways, or neither. Or neither. <laughs> Just come finals times, you guys will be like stressed out uh, or like trying to cope with life. But in this, I think specifically for what we do, the way this course is set up, you attend a panel, you attend a discussion at 1871, 2112. You sit there, you can engage, you can network, you can take it as far as you'd like to, but as for this course's purpose, like Professor Villani said, it's pass-fail. You go, you do your work, and it's on your own time. It's really structured around your schedule and how it helps you succeed and go where you want to go. So, Mike, uh, when you came out to 1871, you met with a bunch of my students and talked about IP with tech startups. Yep. What was what was your what were your thoughts on that? startups protecting their IP? What do they need to do? It's always an adventure. Um, there's always a competition between protecting your IP and, and getting the business off the ground. Um, so I'm an IP litigator, patent litigator. Um, I also I began my career as a patent prosecutor, so I've drafted about 100 patent applications and then and switched to the, the dark side of litigation. Um, with startups, they always want to protect their inventions. They often don't know what their inventions are. Um, and so when I'm talking to a startup, that's usually the most difficult thing we try to figure out. They have something worth protecting, an IP that will benefit their business. But they go, I'm developing an app. Can we patent the app? And I go, I don't know what your app is or what aspect of it is new and not obvious that you can get a patent that's worth you know, just tens of thousands of dollars in upfront capital to get the patent application filed, prosecuted, maybe never even obtained. Um, and so helping them figure out, do I have something patentable, um, actually isn't that difficult. We can square that away in an hour. What's difficult is that we do have something worth patentable and worth the ten thousand dollars we'll spend on a patent, as opposed to hiring someone for a couple months. Um, that's a big decision for a startup. It's a difficult decision for a startup. Um, and I try very hard not to just go. You need to protect this. Um, I don't give that kind of advice um, because it's. It's up to them as a business decision to weigh 10,000 bucks on advertising, 10,000 bucks on trying to protect something five years from now. Um, it's very tricky. What about uh, when entrepreneurs just start working together, developing a technology, and you, you come along maybe a couple of years after the fact? Do you ever run into IP problems where there's no agreements in place? All the time. Um, I would say most of the time. Uh, that's the case, is that the lawyer wasn't in the room right up front when everything was really exciting and papers were getting signed. Um, especially with startups, they leverage their network so heavily. Um, and so one person has a great idea, but he needs someone to code something. Or he's got a great idea, he needs someone to manufacture something. And they run out and do it because that's how you get your business up off the ground. So you, so you start running with it. Um, but with IP, there are unusual sensitivities to disclosures, for example, um, to revealing your secrets to other people. Uh, and so when they do that, what ends up happening is they come back around, it works, we're making money. And then they go, can we patent this? And I go, not anymore. <laughs> and, and that's bad news. Um, or sometimes it's, yes, next week, let's clear the schedule, let's go this way. Um, certainly ownership is always a huge deal. Um, we, we settled the end of the case once um, because there was someone that they were working with who was an inventor in the case and never buttoned that up before the litigation began. We found out about that person in discovery went, hey, take about $10,000 to uh, sign the rights to this patent that you're an inventor on to us. They'll take that money, 10,000 bucks, they're an inventor, not on the patent, we can settle the case, we end the case. Um, 
most a multi-million dollar mistake um, that can't be avoided with a phone call. But it's complicated, and as, as years go by, we, uh, we'll forget about that. Uh, so the earlier the, the lawyer gets involved, um, we can just help people understand that you, know, you could go off and hit the ground running, um, but let us let you know about a few uh, pitfalls along the way. So you guys have been exposed to some IP in some of these talks, right? Some trademark and patents, anything come to mind? Or should we open the floor to questions? What do you think? Any questions from the crowd? Any questions? questions? Yeah, 1871. Yeah, we're actually 1871. Yeah. 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 Hardworking yeah. students yeah. that you get to. Thank you so much, guys. Well, on that note, do you guys have any questions, I guess? Yeah. Questions about... Uh, the incubators, 1871, 2012, IP rights, questions about law school. How do we get into this course? I have, uh, well, I have two questions, but the other one, I don't know. Um, the events, uh, are those like daily? Are there different ones? Like how many it's hours do you have? It's, 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 not, it's not part of the course. It's yeah. literally, um, it's another organization and they have a calendar. You look it up and if you're interested in the event, you simply, uh, it's on Eventbrite. You can just make sure you, uh, you go there and sit down. It's what I'm saying that the way this course is structured is very different than a typical law course. Like in your contracts class, in your constitutional class, you'll have a book, you'll sit down, you'll listen to a lecture, and you'll have a final exam. The way this course is set up is Professor Villalini allows us to go to these events, listen to some legal issues, uh, whatever interests you, you discuss about it later, and uh, we're required to go to four at 1871 or 2112. A lot of them deal with, you know, um, technology these days or things that are really relevant in law today. What's so your other question? Can I just like Google search like 1812 yes. Chicago yeah. and then they yeah. just got they have a website, yeah. they have everything, and they they have uh, separate memberships too. Through uh, the university, DePaul's paired with them, so we don't have to pay for it. You said it was 1812 or 1871. 1871. And then yeah. 2112. And I, I think there's some free events, even if you're yeah. not at DePaul, any, yeah. any member of the public could go. So if that's something you want to do over the summer, go to an event, meet some people, go for it. Yeah, they have webinars too. You don't even have to go there. Sometimes you can just watch the safety of your home. And I think 1871 has one just about every day, and uh, 2112 is probably like every other day. Um, but they, they both have calendars online. Just quickly mentioning, it's really, the good thing about this class is you can really tailor it based on your specific interests. And so let's say you're really interested in technology law, you can just pick and choose specific events that have to pertain to technology law if you're really interested in women's studies and gender uh, issues. You can pick and choose those. It's, it's a great point. It's, yeah, great point. It's, the entire class, I guess, can be really geared toward whatever you want it to be. I think one more note too is that uh, maybe in your 1L you'll forget about different types of law. This course reminds mm -hmm. you of it. Because while you're like scrolling through the calendar, you like see some titles and you're like, oh wow, okay, um, I can go there. So, do you want to talk about that article you wrote on LinkedIn? The article, I, what do you want me to talk about? What, what's the name of it? <laughs> oh, so it has to do with, I kind of briefly touched on it, it's digital marketing and consumer privacy. Uh, I, touched on it a little before, but just has to do with, I guess, the issues that arise in today's digital marketing atmosphere, um, specifically pertaining to what companies can collect, what type of data they can collect from you, um, and how they can use that data to potentially target you to purchase further products. <laughs> and I think your article had talked about the kind of mentioned uh, Europe yes. and data privacy. You know, in the U.S., it's okay a lot of mm -hmm. times to track uh, what websites people are going to and to use that market yeah. data. In Europe, that's a big no-no. Yeah. The EU definitely has higher standards for what is acceptable to, what type of data is acceptable to collect and how they can use that type of data. So. And when you have U.S. companies doing significant business mm -hmm. in Europe, they have to comply with U.S. and European law. Yeah. So it's a big issue. What, um, what, what area of law does that classify under an IP? Um, I would say privacy law, most generally. 
Um, it definitely gets into cybersecurity law. Um, yeah, data privacy. Data privacy. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, what a great question. I, mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I agree with, with Chelsea. Uh, I think it's probably uh, data privacy and, and um, but also I think advertising law. Mm -hmm. And potentially what we talked about a minute ago, potentially data import export laws as well. So what data can you bring in from the U.S. into the EU, and what data can you bring in from the EU back to the U.S., depending on where a corporation is headquartered, depending on where the data is being collected, depending on, on in other words, where are the consumers located, and where does the data physically reside, where are the servers located, or if it's a cloud setup, have you limited the virtual servers and, and, and where they live in terms of a, of a, of a cloud setup. So it, it's data privacy, data security, and, and advertising law too. Cool, and the reason I ask that is because um, what I like about IP, this is just a general like IP law kind of question. Um, it's, you know, you can go into like different areas, it touches base everywhere, but what's discouraging is the patent law because I think you need like a Bachelor of Science to, uh, like, the background. Bar take the patent bar, bar. Yeah, not so you can still bar. so you have to have a background career wise what yeah. can you like how can you work in patent so law? I something I I don't have a background in anything right with, uh, but I I'm studying data privacy uh, under a guided research with Professor Bellini and so I'm taking several other certifications to get certified as a uh, data privacy um, specialist and then you find somewhere like um, a bunch of places you could just literally go on indeed.com type in like a uh, data analyst data privacy analyst and jobs will pop up and so that's when your JD and, and your license as an attorney can cross over with data privacy and I, I think that's what these events really help you to you can talk to people that work in JD advantage jobs JD preferred jobs they might not be at a law firm but having a JD is preferred required or it, it goes along with it you might not have you no know, background in patents. Uh, I think that avenue is, you're right, it's a little tricky because I, I don't have a background in that. So I'm not, I can't take the patent bar and I won't be. And I don't want to go back to school to get a degree so I could take that. And rather, I'll just find a different avenue and there are jobs there. Um. But, but, can it? <laughs> but there is also an additional point to that. You only need a Bachelor of Science or Engineering if you're going to prosecute patents, uh, write patents. Yeah. But if you want to be a patent litigator or if you want to litigate patents, like patent infringement issues, and a lot of firms have patent litigators, large firms, you don't have to uh, have a technical background. In fact, a lot of people will say that, you know, sometimes not having a technical background may, can make you a better litigator because you can explain technical issues to lay people and non-technical people or jury, uh, probably in some more like easier terms yeah. than a very technical person. So there are a lot of patent litigators and very good ones and famous ones that not necessarily uh, technical or have technical background. Thank you. Just quickly going off of that, um, I know if you're with worried about, I guess, being marketable and uh, for an IP job, I guess the, without a technical background, I think classes like this really show uh, your interest and experience with regard to um, tech-based industries and also certifications like the CIPP. Um, the C is it CIPP CX. Oh, that, for the ISACA? I, mm -hmm. Yeah. For There's a bunch system. of certifications that you can show that you're, I guess, well-versed in intellectual property privacy type issues. And mm -hmm. sometimes, as Ellen was saying, that's preferred. So, that, you know, I think for a lot of attorneys, uh, a lot of generalist attorneys, they might spend a third of their time on IP issues. They might not be an IP attorney per se, but it's becoming such a big part of so many uh, lawyers practice areas. And yeah. Mike, you probably have some comments on that as well. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm an Ice Miller. Um, you know, we're, we're a large law firm, uh, Midwest-based, a um, bunch of different groups, business law, employment, the whole deal. Uh, we have a cyber uh, security and privacy group, um, which is a handful. It's a mixture of what you would call IP lawyers, 
business lawyers. Um, some have patent backgrounds, most do not. Um, that is, is becoming a bigger and bigger deal and a bigger and bigger focus of the firm as it becomes a bigger and bigger focus of all of our clients. They all have cybersecurity concerns, they all have privacy concerns, because they're all operating websites, apps, collecting data, and so forth. Um, so a lot of people's full-time practices now are cybersecurity, privacy, and then transactional licensing um, agreements, um, merger and acquisition kind of blend in there. And they'll work with um, maybe the, the patent lawyers like me of a hard science background and, and leverage that in my day to day. Um, but they certainly don't need that to be full IP lawyers and knee deep in that kind of work. Um, I can tell you, I don't do any cybersecurity privacy law. But I know Nick Berger in our office who does, and he gets roped in, and vice versa. For that kind of thing. So, without the, the hard background, is not. A, um, issue. So you have transactional attorneys at your firm dealing with IP provisions in a contract and understanding, IP, but they're not. They don't have scientific or engineering background, right? No, and it's a it's a big deal for for them. Every merger and acquisition, um, most business deals have will have IP provisions. In and then the cybersecurity and privacy is a consistent overlap in that. Um, I would consider all of them to be IP lawyers because um, they see enough of those issues. They know IP law, some of that patent law. Um, um, and it's right now it's thriving. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, we just expanded, we just hired a partner from a law firm this week because it's um, truly an up and coming sort of area. And you probably want to see candidates who have some IP and tech in there education, right? Yeah, it always helps. The, the interest, I'll, I'll echo that. Um, I have a hard science background. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, so I, I mean, I, I'm, it doesn't, it helps me a little bit with efficiency and terminology and maybe some credibility from talking to a guy with a PhD. I go, I can't go into background. <laughs> um, but, but really, I mean, every day I have to learn what my clients are doing. And I'm not an engineer, I'm a lawyer. Um, and so you can, you're, you're smart, you can always catch up, you can always learn. Uh, the interest, are you interested in what your client is doing? Um, that is a huge deal. And so if you can show that and prove it with taking these classes, I'm really interested in this. You know, the IP litigation, um, I work with some fantastic patent litigators uh, who do not have hard science backgrounds, do not have patent bar admissions, they're spectacular litigators. Um, they can learn the technology because they're really smart. You know, I was also thinking with the whole tech thing, a lot of people are afraid of technology getting, getting, you know, getting into the weeds too much, but I would think that a law student with no technical background uh, could maybe take a couple of introductory computer courses, take a smattering of tech law courses uh, here at DePaul, and I think you'd be pretty well positioned to get out there and, and start working as a, as a tech lawyer. So. And, and that's that unique program we were talking about earlier where we're working on cross-listing. Yeah, we hope yeah. to have it off the ground soon uh, where students could take maybe one to three computer courses at our computer school and have them apply toward your, toward your law degree. And then, yeah. That'd be during like your second or third or during one of the summers? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? But we just started our new tech law boot camp. Uh, oh, nice. Some of our one were there this afternoon, yes? Yes. <laughs> Too bad you didn't join us. So today we were actually trying to learn some technology basic, how internet works really on the technical side uh, well, rather than tools, the... right? You've got the interconnected tools. What? Yeah, you know, what? Tools. So, 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 <laughs> you can, you can <laughs> attest to that. We were here actually in this classroom and uh, our presenter, our lecturer today was uh, um, our colleague from computer school. Uh, so we were like, okay, can you call in? explain to you know give us some technical technology basics for non-technical students or somebody who has zero knowledge of technology so it was uh, it was interesting well and i think you'd have such an advantage there's so many attorneys out there who don't <laughs> understand the basics of, of tech and you know if you just take a few courses you're, you're really at, at an advantage i would think in the marketplace yeah. that's great
So if any of you want to come back, we have one more next Thursday on internet law. Professor Greenberg will be uh, doing that le lecture. And then a week from, so two weeks from today, we have a lecture on cybersecurity and privacy law uh, with one of our alums, uh, who is a counsel at one of the cybersecurity companies. Uh, you provide that a, free, a free lunch, right? Yes, free lunch. <laughs> Can I get his email? <laughs> Professor Greenberg also teaches the internet law. For, Professor Greenberg uh, teaches course. internet law, correct. Uh, he teaches internet law and he teaches uh, trademarks and unfair competition law, uh, which I believe he's teaching this semester, correct? Yes, he's yes. Yes. He does copyright as well. He, he does is, copyright as well, yeah. that is correct. Greenberg is one of the professors, very great guy, funny, energetic. Have you guys had him? Yeah, I've had yeah. him a couple yeah. times. Yeah, he throws his wallet around, to explain to you the difference between stolen and found. Great guy. Um, <laughs> anyway. He likes to sit on the table. Yeah. Stand this, on the table. But um, I would heavily emphasize, if you guys are interested in that type of law, too, to attend what uh, Professor Gutenjahnset was just explaining and get those emails. Any other questions, guys? Do you guys need more coffee? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have like three containers. Well, this is a this is a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Wait, I got one. That, well, can we read your article? Yeah, yeah. it's on oh. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I can. Her name is Chelsea Murray. I'll write it on the board for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really trying to push your article. <laughs> <laughs> or we can forward you a link. How yeah, about yes. that? <laughs> All right, well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank all. you, guys. Thank you.